We just repopulated this uh, bee yard recently. Uh, it's going to be our cell building yard. And these double deeps were brought in here to be our starter finishers. As you can see, they're fairly strong colonies. That's what you need when you're building cells. And uh, those two colonies on the end are breeder queens. Each spring, we purchase queens from two friends of mine in North Florida who uh, we send our breeder queens to and they graft from those queens and send us back their daughters for our packages and nukes that we make up in the early spring. But after spring's over, we start making our own queen cells when we have good weather for mating in our area. And I purchase uh, typically two to four artificially inseminated breeder queens. Last year, I got two from Sue, Sue Kobe in Washington State. She's the lady that started the New World Carniolan project and still maintains it today. The two breeder queens I purchased from her last year were uh, Carniolan queens inseminated with Caucasian semen, and uh, they were very good. I like Caucasian bees. I have experience from the past with them, and I actually liked them. They have a couple drawbacks. Uh, one is the propolis production is really quite something if you get pure Caucasian bees, and that's the main reason that many people don't like to use them. Uh, with the new information coming to light these days about um, propolis, i beginning to think it's a pretty good thing. Anyway, I'll talk about that a little more after I get through going through these breeder colonies over here and see how our introduction went. I try to be very careful with them. They're very expensive. Uh, these two are daughters of queens that Sue had, one queen that Sue had that was four years old. It was a carniolan queen inseminated with Caucasian semen, and she uh, grafted from that queen and then inseminated her daughters for me with pure Caucasian semen. So if I'm doing my math right, that makes them 75% Caucasian. And uh, I'm going to head in this direction. I'm going to start working with Caucasian bees more, and I'll talk about that after I have a look at these. When trying to get expensive breeder queens, uh, introduced we pull out every trick in the book one is using push-in cages which is very effective these colonies were started about five days ago uh, they were started with primarily hatching brood we didn't have very many bees in them and we moved them here in the middle of the day when they were open so we lost all the field force so we expect to get really good introduction when we do that. There's the cage. I see our breeder queen in there. She's got a nice fluorescent blue dot on her. And when I look very closely, she's already started laying eggs inside this cage. When we put this cage on, there weren't any bees in the cage but her. We put it over a patch of hatching brood. About a quarter of this section was hatching literally the day we put her under this cage. So the bees hatched out with her in there. That's really one of the best tricks for getting a queen introduced properly. I'm just going to pull this cage off and just let her have her way. It looks like the bees have accepted her completely. So there's a nice shot of a carniolan Caucasian queen. Her offspring will be 25% carniolan and 75% Caucasian. You can see the little numbered disc on her back that's glued on her. That'll be with her the rest of her life. You're looking at a $1,000 breeder queen right there. So we're obviously going to be just as very careful as we can with her. We got two so far, and we're going to get two more before the summer's over. When I was reviewing the video I took earlier today in the bee yard, I could see clearly that the pictures of this little screen push-in cage weren't very good. The camera wasn't centered very well. It's real simple. It's just eighth-inch hardware cloth 
bent into a square block uh, with a little door on the side that you can release the queen out of the hole in the cage through. I'm going to put out a video this summer on requeening and I'll get in, in more in depth on this cage, how we make it and how we use it in that video. Should be out in a few weeks, I hope, if I get the time. Um, people are asking me why in the world would I want to introduce Caucasian stock into our apiary. And they have some pretty unique characteristics and some are very desirable and some aren't so desirable from some points of view. Now, the one that really scares people about pure-blooded Caucasians is this tendency to propolize. It can be extreme. Um, I've had a lot of experience with it. I used to purchase queens in Northern California in the mid 80s. So there was a queen breeder there that had some pretty good Caucasian bees. And then later in the mid 90s, I purchased a lot of Caucasians from a fella in Mississippi. Um, he's retired, long retired now, but uh, he had a pretty good line of Caucasians going there for several decades. Um, this tendency to propolize can be extreme if you got some pretty pure-blooded Caucasians. A lot of people look at that as a very bad thing, but with some of the information coming out recently on just how good propolis is for not only humans, but for the bees specifically, um, I, I've been taking another look at that and have decided that I think I want to push Caucasian uh, genetics back into my outfit. Um, I, had a, I had a neat experience a few years ago. I was sitting at a dinner table at a banquet at a beekeeping conference where Marla Spivak was the featured keynote speaker and got to talk with her a little bit at dinner and got to watch her presentation. And uh, they've done some pretty interesting studies up there at the University of Minnesota on propolis and how good it is for bees. Um, there's a little bit more to it than meets the eye. Propolis, of course, is a resin that the bees collect. There's nothing added to it. It's just resin that the bees collect. And it's highly antimicrobial, it, uh, which makes it antifungal, antibacterial. Um, it, it even has effects on a lot of the viruses that, the, that are attributed to a heavy mite infestation. And uh, in that talk, she showed a lot of graphs and shared a lot of information on the studies they'd done. In the description of this video, I'm going to put a link to one of her talks that she did for Brushy Mountain Bee Farm, and I would recommend watching that. I think most people would find that very interesting. In Marla's talk, she talked about something she calls uh, the propolis envelope. It's, it's what the bees do inside their cavity, or their hive, uh, so to speak. Uh, not only do they seal the cracks and holes and glue things together, but they kind of polish the inside, or polish may be the wrong word, uh, I'm going to use the word shellac, they shellac the inside of their cavity with propolis, and it really, it, the way I read it, it, it kind of becomes part of their immune system. It makes their cavity antibacterial, antifungal, um, antimicrobial, if you will, and I think this is very desirable. It uh, uh, means that uh, collect a lot of propolis are shown to have uh, much more resistance to European fowl brood, American fowl brood, um, a lot more resistance to chalk brood. That was the one that was most notable in the charts. And that, that caught my attention. Um, my experience with Caucasians in the past was actually pretty good. I, I view them as a very gentle bee. Uh, I really liked working with them, except for the propolis, of course. Um, they have a couple of, of characteristics that are, are, are a little different than the Italians and the Carniolans. One is that they, they build up later. Uh, they have a slower build up in the spring. Uh, they peak later in the season, which a few decades ago might have been a big deal to me, but here lately I've been changing the way I do things. Um, those of you that know me and watch these videos know I've done a lot of traveling in the past and pollinating almonds and other things. And I decided to kind of pull the borders in on this outfit and stay closer to home. We're going to try to keep bees right here in northeast Georgia and northwest uh, North Carolina and stay right here in the mountains and and try to remodel our, our the way we do business uh, with that in mind. And I think Caucasians will fit into that perfectly. I don't need colonies to build up early anymore. In fact, don't want them to build up too early. 
Uh, the Italians are really good at that, and that's uh, very desirable if you're going to pollinate almonds or something like that. I'm not going to pollinate almonds anymore. I'm just going to stay closer to home. Um, I, I don't know if it's because they build up later that these uh, Caucasian bees have a lower tendency to swarm, but they definitely do. It was very noticeable to me in the past, and uh, I've talked to Sue Kobe, who I'm getting these breeder queens from, and she says the same thing, and other people that have experience with Caucasians will report the same thing. A lot of people consider that a bad thing, but with our new business model, I think that's going to be just perfect for us. Um, I'm really looking forward to perhaps lower swarming tendency. The Carniolans especially can have a high tendency to swarm in the spring, and the Italians can too, but uh, uh, the Caucasians definitely have a lower tendency to swarm. Um, one of our major honey flows here where we're at is the sourwood flow. It doesn't even start blooming till around late June to the first week in July. And although uh, making our own local spring honey is a great thing, uh, I need bees that are going to be peaking in early to mid-summer for this sourwood flow that we we go after. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. We have been purchasing queens from uh, Sue Kobe and Joe Latchaw for several years. I didn't get any from Joe the last year. And Joe Latchaw, Latchaw Apiaries up in Ohio, uh, Ohio, has a really good strain of Carniolans and and then Sue Kobe, of course, is the founder of the New World Carniolan Project, and uh, she still maintains that project. Uh, I consider Sue one of the premier queen breeders in the country, in the world, actually. And uh, I think I mentioned it in the earlier part of the video, but I'll talk about it a little more. Um, she ha um, went to the Republic of Georgia, which is uh, uh, borders Russia, that's where the Caucasus Mountains are, and uh, that's where you find pure Caucasian bees. And she brought home some semen, and she's been working with that for a while now, quite a while, I think. And uh, last year, I purchased some breeder queens from Sue that were pure Carniolan inseminated with pure Caucasian semen. And I really liked what I saw. I enjoyed working with those bees, and it reminded me of the old days when things were so sticky. Um, some of those bees, you can actually scrape the propolis off your fingers when you're done working with a hive tool. It, it can really be quite a lot. I have to figure out how to get that off my fingers before I get in the truck. Sue says baby oil works, uh, helps a little bit. I might try that. But um, I really enjoyed working with them, and I'm looking forward to pushing more Caucasian into our outfit. The two breeders I got from her this year so far their mother was a carniole and queen inseminated with 100% uh, Caucasian semen. And the daughters I just received were inseminated with 100% Caucasian semen. So I believe that makes them 75% or their offspring 75% Caucasian. Uh, their drones will be highly Caucasian. And once I populate the outfit with those drones, uh, we'll move forward quite rapidly uh, with that stock. Um, they're, they're more frugal than Italian bees. Uh, they, they have a, how do I explain this? I had a yard of bees, oh gosh, about, uh, I think it's been 20 years ago when I, well, over 20 years ago when I was buying those queens from Mississippi. I set up a yard in western North Carolina that was half Caucasian queens and half golden Italians. I wanted to do a little experiment with them and, and, uh, compare the differences. And uh, it appeared that the Italians had a larger population, which is what you would expect. And uh, I could look across the yard after the sourwood flow and see clearly, uh, after uh, handling them during the flow, that every Italian colony had another super or two of honey on it when compared to the Caucasian. And at that time, I kind of figured that they just made more honey than the Caucasians. And, um, I was kind of in a hurry to get the honey off and get it extracted, and I put escape boards on all the colonies without really diving in to see what was going on downstairs. They were double deep colonies, and I stripped all the honey off and uh, spent a couple of weeks getting it extracted and then came back to treat them and try to start getting them ready for winter. And I had the shock of my life. The uh, 
a couple of the Italian colonies were dead. They had starved to death already just after two weeks without the supers on. And they had a lot of honey in the supers. There was two to four supers, solid medium supers on all of these Italian colonies and the, the Caucasians had two or three. And I went through all the, all the Italians and fed up the ones that uh, were still there. One, two ended up being dead out of that whole uh, situation. In just two or three weeks, they'd starved to death. It was very evident that they had been completely full of brood and uh, had not really packed a lot of honey into the brood nest. They put it all up into the supers. When I got done with the Italians, I went over and worked with the Caucasian bees and uh, was very pleasantly surprised to see that almost every Caucasian colony had 40 to 60 pounds of honey on it. Uh, it reminded me of what I'd seen back in the 80s, and that is that the Caucasian bees tend to keep their brood nests more confined. Um, it's more confined and defined, whereas the Italian bees tend to have more brood and scatter it all over and don't really keep the honey right around the brood like the Caucasians and the Carniolans do. And uh, that was pretty neat to see. And watching those Caucasian bees through the winter, they were very frugal. They came out in the spring with a lot of honey yet. Uh, of course, I fed them in the fall and got them even heavier. And in the next, the next spring, they were just a, a pleasure to work with. I didn't have to worry about feeding them in the spring like I did the Italians. And uh, they were very gentle again in the spring, even on the early spring days when the weather can be so bad and the bees can be so nasty at, at times. And I worked with them for a while. That, that fellow went out of business. He retired, so I quit buying queens from him and kind of got away from Caucasian for a couple decades. And um, here I am again, looking forward to doing it again. And uh, after I've had them for another year or so, I'll do another video and report back on my experiences and and uh, report what I see.